This nation many times forgets its, its founding. It was founded upon God's word. The reason we have America is because we had those who left England and came for religious freedom to worship God and to serve God and build a nation that loved God. You know how we need to get back to that. Get back to God's word and quit accepting just anything and everything that they say is truth and is right because it's not. We're living in a day and time when people are, if they shout it loud enough and long enough, people just begin to accept it. And I told the teen class this morning we need to take the word of God and let that be our gauge about truth and reality. Because the fact is, without a gauge, you'll not stand. We need to get back to the Word of God. Take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18, if you would please stand for the reading of God's Word. With all the faults and all the problems that America has, I am glad to be an American. No other nation has accomplished what America has accomplished. God has greatly used America, and I do not take that lightly. But a desire to see America serve God and not turn away from God. And what will make America great is when we have great churches again that serve God and live for God. <coughs> Meetings like this that we had this morning, coming together to worship the Lord, hear God's word preached, and to sing songs, to lift Him up, and to... to Direct our families according to the Word of God is what's going to make America great again. Much of what has taken place in the past few years has been, has been an attack upon the things of God and has tore America down in many ways. Genesis chapter 18, let's begin reading verse 16, a very familiar portion of Scripture here. If you was to back up in an in a earlier part of the chapter there, you find that the Lord has come to to visit with Abraham and to tell him that he and Sarah, even in their old age, will have a child. Lot has left Abraham and, uh, prior to this and has, has sought out to, to go down towards Sodom and Gomorrah to, to take his herds and his flocks down there and to raise his families around Sodom and Gomorrah uh, because it was, the area wasn't able to handle both of them. And so, so uh, Abraham gave Lot the choice of what he would do. And, and always remember this, Lot had a choice. Lot had a choice. He made his own choices. And he went towards Sodom and Gomorrah. And now after the Lord had come and spoken with, with Abraham and Sarah here, and he has some angels with him, they're on their way down to Sodom and Gomorrah because he's about to bring judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 16 says, And the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Otherwise, should I not let him know that I'm about ready to judge Sodom and Gomorrah? So he goes on there, And seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the... Uh, 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 excuse me. Should become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and, and they shall keep the way of the Lord and do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the, the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grievous. I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Preventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, and that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes." And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. 
Preventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous, wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? He said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again and said, Preventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said to him, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak, preventure there be thirty, or shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. He said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, preventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Preventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place. Look back in verse 20 and then back down verse 32. It says, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grievous, he's about to destroy it. Verse 32, he said, Oh, let not the Lord's angry, and I will, will speak yet this once. Preventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. You see, ten was the number for Sodom and Gomorrah. Ten righteous souls. He said, If I find ten there, he said, I'll not destroy it. But as we read on, and if you go into the next chapter, chapter 19, we find that not even ten was found in the whole plain of Sodom and Gomorrah. See, it wasn't just two cities. If you read that and you study it out, it was Sodom and then Gomorrah and all the plain, which had little towns in it all around them. Thousands and thousands of people. And the Lord said, I could not find... Ten righteous souls. Couldn't find ten. Here's a place that Abraham lives. Or not Abraham, but Lot lives. Lot was raised around Abraham and he knew the Lord. So he had Lot. You had his wife. And as you read on, you find that he still had two daughters at home. That's four right there. If you read on, you find that he had sons-in-laws. More than one. So he at least had two more daughters. That would have been six, plus their husbands would have been eight. And more than likely, they had children. Easily should have found ten which I believe is why Abraham stopped at 10, thinking surely Lot's family, there's at least 10, at least 10 in Lot's family that would be righteous, that love the Lord, that follow the Lord, that obey the Lord, that will save Sodom and Gomorrah in the plain. But the Lord did not find them. It winds up that the angels of the Lord, as they show up, that they wind up taking Lot, his wife, and his two, children, two daughters that are still home, taking them out of Sodom and Gomorrah before he destroys it. That's the mercy of God right there. That he would lead them out. And so we find that not ten righteous people could be saved. And so Sodom and Gomorrah's number to save it was ten. My question and the title of my message this morning is America, what's your number? America, what's your number? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for loving us. And though, Lord, this is a great nation, Lord, we see it faltering and see it turning away from you. Lord, our hearts are heavy concerning that. Lord, we, as we look around, we see the sin, we see the wickedness going on in such a great way. And Lord, it's, Lord, I know that it breaks your heart and I know that it has to be paid for. Lord, I pray that you'd forgive us as a nation, that you'd cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness, Lord. And even as 
Abraham pleaded, Lord, I plead with you that America would come back to you, Lord, and that you wouldn't have to destroy America. We realize that we're living in the last days and many things are taking place because of that. Yet, Lord, I desire to see America turn back to you, Lord, my children and grandchildren. And Lord, that, Lord, that they would be spared from all the tragedies and difficulties that we see going on today. And Lord, as we call unto you, Lord, we ask most of all, Lord, that even if this morning, Lord, in this service, Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, help them to see the seriousness of the hour, and Lord, that they would turn to you and receive you as their Savior. Lord, I pray now, give us wisdom, give us direction as we preach thy word. And Lord, may there be a seriousness in our hearts and lives for us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. We look at Sodom and Gomorrah here, and first of all, look at the sin of Sodom. The Bible says that the sin of Sodom was great. It was great. Look at Genesis 18, verse 20. It says, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. By reading the Scripture and looking here, we know of at least three overwhelming reasons that the Lord called their sin great. We know that, uh, and it sheds a lot of light on it, the Lord said that their sin was, first of all, that their sin was grievous. He said it's, it's heavy. He said it's terrible. And for the Lord to say, you know, knowing man and knowing the frailty of man and knowing man's weakness, and, and for the Lord to say their, their sin is terrible. It's beyond just bad. It's terrible. It's grievous. He said it grieves me when I see that. So we know that their sin had to be great. Secondly, he couldn't find ten righteous. He could not, in all the thousands of people that would have been in Sodom and Gomorrah in the plain. And at one time I read the size of that area and it was unbelievable. I always thought of maybe two cities, two small towns or something there that he destroyed. But it wasn't. History records that it was a huge place. Thousands of people. So what we find is that they couldn't find ten righteous, ten people who loved the Lord, ten people who served the Lord, ten people who were dedicated to the Lord, ten people who would stand for God. Thirdly, we find that the homosexuality was rampant and had went unchecked and was accepted by the leaders of Sodom. In chapter 19, and begin verse 4, it says, But before they lay down, the men of the city, even what happened, the, the angels had come into the city and, and, and Lot seen them and he, he knew how wicked the city was and that these were men and, and they were angels. And so he brought them into his home because he knew how wicked it was. Verse 4 says, but before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round about, uh, both, around both old and young all the, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said, we, uh, Where are the men which came into thee, to, uh, into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And that is, a, that is a way of saying that we may have a relation with them, a sexual relation. It says they were men. They were homosexuals. And they said from every quarter of the, every area, quarter of the, of the city. So there was a, a lot of them. And Lot went out the door, uh, went out the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing for Therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. They said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came into sojourn, and we will needs be a judge. Now uh, will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. And they began to attack. They was going to just force their way in. If you read on, the angels reached out and grabbed hold of Lot and pulled Lot back inside. And then they smote all those men with blindness. Even if you, as you read it, it says they wearied themselves. as they, Even after they were smitten with blindness, they kept trying to go in. That's how wicked that sin is. 
So we see the wickedness of Solomon and Gomorrah. If you read over in the New Testament, the book of Jude, you find in verse 7, it says, Even Solomon and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh or else homosexuality, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And so God judged Solomon and Gomorrah and he rained down fire and brimstone and destroyed the whole plains, destroyed Sodom, destroyed Gomorrah, destroyed the whole plain because of the wickedness. And it was more than the homosexuality, it was all the things that was coupled with it. It doesn't start there. It always starts with sin. It always starts from turning from the Lord. As I think upon the mercies of God, I would have to say that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was great for the Lord to destroyed it as he did you begin to look at it and, and hey listen I know the mercies of God and the Lord is merciful he's long suffering and he's patient he say how do you know preacher because I know how long suffering and patient he is with me and so he's a merciful God but it comes a point when the Lord says enough is enough for even there he couldn't find ten he said if you could just find ten people in all these cities just ten he said, if you can just find ten people in all these cities, in all that area, that, will, that love me, that follow me, that will obey me, he said, I'll spare it. But they couldn't even find ten in Sodom, Gomorrah, and all the cities around it. Not even ten. The sin was great. They no doubt had turned from God. They had to have known of the Lord. If you go back and study the histories in that area... They knew of the Lord, they, yet they had rejected Him and sinned greatly against Him. In Genesis 13, 13 says, But the men of Sodom, the Lord speaking here, He says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Exceedingly. Their lifestyles and all the sin that they had done. And you've got to understand the, uh, the progression of sin and, and how it turns people away from God. When you begin to look at people's lives, it doesn't start with the, the gross, wicked sin, but it starts with, with the little things in their lives and, and maybe even a Christian beginning uh, to quit reading their Bibles and, and be quit going to church and, and, and it begins to get worse and it begins to get worse and it begins to get worse and before long, they're a long ways from God. Not all at once, but just a little step at a time. You look at a society... In a society of people that will not govern themselves must be governed. People who will not put their own selves under the rule of God's hand will have to fall under that hand. And many times what we find is nation after nation over the years have, we've seen in history we've seen the rise and fall of the Roman Empire and different empires and, and it was always because of wicked you study the nations who have fell you study the nations who, have, who are no longer in existence basically you study the nations who were once great rulers in this world you find out why did they fall and you will find that it was because of sin and immorality and not living for God you say, well, preacher, you know, uh, how, maybe they just didn't know. They knew about the Lord, and yet they had turned from the Lord. Could I say America's sin is exceedingly great also? We're killing millions of babies. In this country. With abortion. The creation of God creation of God. We're glorifying homosexuality. We've passed laws and allowed homosexual marriages. We now are pushing in this nation transgender normalization and special rights above the rights of others. We're departing from God's Word on every hand. You begin to get into God's Word and it lays out God's principle for all these things. 
the immoral lifestyles and the adultery among even professed Christians today is rampant. America has turned away from God's people, Israel. More and more you hear about America cutting off from Israel and our government leaders chastising Israel on different things. If I could sum it up, I'd sum it up with Isaiah chapter 5. It says, verse 20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. They put darkness for light and light for darkness. They put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the, the chaff, to their, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossoms shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. And the Lord's saying here, He says, you know, woe unto a nation, woe unto a people who will call that which is right, wrong which we'll call that which is sweet, bitter. Well, it's amazing. I look at all the things that's taking place and all the, all the laws and different things that's happening, and it's like, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe in America, America that was founded on God's Word, that we're doing the things and having the things going, and on and on and on and on. Go. Hey, listen, I, I, I am shocked that we have the two leading presidential candidates of who we have in America. And, I, and, and I'm appalled at what's taking place in America. And I see America falling to its knees and, and, and coming down as that once great nation. Because Why? Because we have left the Word of God that made us great. Tocqueville, when he came to America, he looked for America's greatness. He looked in the factories. He looked in the, he looked in the, the fields. He looked at all the greatness of America and all that America had. And he said it wasn't until he went to the church houses that preached the Word of God with fire. He said, America is great because America is good. And he went on to say, America, but America will cease to be great when America ceases to be good. And we have turned our backs in America upon God. And all the junk that's going on, we've allowed to take place. America needs to turn back to the Lord. My question is, America, what's your number? America, what's your number? You see, it's been said many times, if God doesn't judge America, and I believe this is true, He would have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And God's not going to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. The number was about righteousness, not professed righteousness. Notice there in verse 23, it says, and Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Preventure there be fifty righteous within the city, and with, uh, wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for fifty righteous that are therein? That far be from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and, and that the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, if I find in Sodom, and notice why it says, 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. He said, listen, and notice how the Abraham, he's, he's going to him and he's saying, oh, uh, he's talking about the righteous. He said, will you destroy all the wickedness because, uh, uh, with those who are righteous? He said, what if there is 50 righteous in there? He said, preacher, what's righteous? Righteous are those who are, are rightly trying to serve God and live for the Lord and obey His Word. 
That would be righteous. Those who are trying to live for the Lord. Uh, we're not perfect and we're not going to live perfect lives. But the righteous would be those who are right with God, walking with God, serving God, living for the Lord, not ashamed of God, serving Him with all their hearts, willing to stand with God. That would be the righteous. So it wasn't those who said, I go to church on Sunday, but lived wicked lives through the week. It wasn't those who said, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a good man because I, I take care of the poor over here, but live wicked lives. That's not righteous. It wasn't those who say, I pay all my bills and I'm, I'm good to my wife and I'm good to my children and, I, and, I, and you know, I'm trying to be a good citizen. But won't follow God. You see, it was those who were righteous. Not professed to be righteous. As we look at America today, if God's looking at our number, it's not those who say that they're saved. It's not those who say that they're Christians. I'm amazed at people that get up on, on, on stage that have, have sang filthy, rotten songs and, 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 and those who get in filthy, rotten movies and get up on stage and get a award and say, oh, I just want to thank God. Far be that from righteous. It's not those that, that you would knock on their door and, and they come to the door and they've got their, their bud dumber in their hand and they say, and you say, hey, I'd like to invite you to church. And do you know Jesus Christ? Well, I, you know, I used to go to church, but I don't anymore and, and everything. You know, they're all hypocrites down there at the church. That's not the righteous. I'm not saying the man's not saved. But what I am saying, that's not the righteous. The righteous is not the ones that take their boat down to the lake and baptize it every Sunday. That's not the righteous. I'm not saying they're not saved. But I'm talking about a people that can save America. A people that love God. A people that put the Lord first in their lives. He said, I couldn't find ten. And I look around today and I say, Lord, what's our number in America? I mean, this is supposed to be a godly nation and we've had, we've had every opportunity. We've got churches on every street in, in Marshall and, and in other towns. And man, I'll tell you what, the town I was, I, I'm orig, I was from there in, in New Franklin and everything, I mean, there's churches in, all, in that little community. There's only 1,100 people and man, I, it's about 1,100 churches. The town that I grew up in, Piedmont in southeast Missouri, I tell you what, there, there's, there's more churches than you can shake a stick at. But that doesn't make it righteous. It's those who serve God. Those who are looking to follow the Lord with their hearts. Those who are willing to follow the Lord and do what's right. Righteous, this is walking rightly before the Lord, seeking forgiveness when we sin and, and seeking to please the Lord and, and obey His Word. This nation is full of professed Christians that we live in and yet are not living for the Lord and not obeying Him and seeking to please Him. Many, hey listen, which are embracing the wickedness of this nation and, and helping promote it and helping to put their stamp of approval on the, on the junk that's going on. Therefore, they're a part of the, of the sin that, that will destroy our nation and our children and our grandchildren and bring ultimately the judgment of God upon America. Say, preacher, this isn't a very uplifting message. Hey, listen, I'll get there in a minute. You see, righteousness is about the Lord. It's not about you and me and what I want out of this world. Hey, listen, that's why America is in the shape that she's in. Hey, listen, uh, terrible choices uh, that we have today uh, uh, for president, the shootings, the terrorist activities, the uh, immorality, the, the calling right, wrong, and living like animals and uh, abusing children on, on and on goes the list of, of all the junk that's happening in America, turning away from God and, 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 and acting as though it's nothing. Proverbs 14, 34, the Lord told us, He said, Righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Could I say it again? America, what's our number? 
What's our number? Could I ask you also, lost person, what's your number? What? What's your number? What's your number? You see, every one of us were born, and immediately we were born, we begin to die. Immediately. Because of this old sinful body. I mean, that's just way. God made us to live for eternity, but yet, because of sin, this body racked with sin, we begin to die immediately. What is your number? See, nobody in this room knows when you're going to die. Every person in this room has a time set to die. God has a plan for your life, and, and there's an appointed time that you will die. You don't know your number. But therefore, also, you may need to understand, hey, listen, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, there comes a time when the Lord say, okay, I've given you opportunity, and I've given you opportunity, and I've given you opportunity, and I've given you opportunity to receive me as your Savior. I'm done. I quit. I'm not going to draw you anymore. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3, it says, The Lord shall not always strive with man. He said His Spirit shall not always strive with us. And many times what we don't understand is we think that we're going to get saved when we want to get saved. We're going to do it when we want to do it. We're going to wait until it's time, convenient for us. My friend, can I tell you something? You don't get saved when you want to get saved. You get saved when God deals with you or you don't get saved at all. You don't manipulate God. And many times people think, oh, I'll do it when I want. No, you won't. Because when God quits dealing with you, the Bible says that you must be drawn by Him. And when He quits dealing with your heart and life, and when He quits drawing you, there's no way you can get saved. We find that many times we, 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 we say, well, you know, I, I, I'm going to be all right, you know. And there's those that, that uh, like He told those that was talking about who were, who were religious, and, and they, they was doing their own religious thing there in Matthew chapter 15. He told the disciples, it was the religious crowd, he told them, he said, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall in the ditch. There comes a time when the Lord says, leave them alone. You know, it would be a terrible thing. Just think, Matt, just think. It would be a terrible thing that if you was lost, that... You kept opportunity to get saved. You heard the preaching of God's Word and, and God dealt with your heart and you knew that you was lost and you knew you needed to get saved and you kept saying no and you kept saying no and you kept saying no. And finally the Lord says, okay, have it your way. Holy Spirit, leave them alone. And when that happens, you cannot get saved. you're lost this morning what's your number you say preacher I don't know what my number is I can tell you what it is partially because the Lord said today is the day of salvation harden not your heart you say well there may be another day preacher can you guarantee that I can't I can't. So what's your number? Today could be that number. You see, the Lord loved you. And He died in your place. That you could be saved. The Bible tells us that God commendeth His love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But if you back up in verse 10, he says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You say, well, preacher, I've prayed a prayer before. Yeah, there's a lot of people that's prayed a prayer, and they're going to die and go to devil's hell. They're going to miss heaven by about 11 inches. What? 11 inches. The distance from here to here. It's with the heart, not with the head. It's with the heart. Then let me ask this morning, Christian, what's your number? You see, yes, you may be saved. You may be on your way to heaven. 
But if you've got sin in your life and you won't repent and you won't get it right with the Lord and you continue to live in your sin, hey, listen. The Lord may say, bring them home early. We find in Scripture that deals with the fact that He will destroy the body to spare the soul. The Lord may be dealing with your heart about some things in your life and you keep telling Him no and you keep pushing back, you keep pushing back, you keep telling Him no. One of these days He may say, okay. And He may let you go. What's your number? It may just be deadness in your spiritual life and you, you won't deal with it. You're not out there in, in great sin or anything, but you're, you're not there living for the Lord uh, uh, either. But James 4.17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Christian, if there's sin in your life, get it taken care of. What's your number? Could I say, church, what is our number? You see, how we need to be alive for the Lord and obeying the Word of God and on fire for Him and pointing others to Jesus Christ and, and walking with Him. I don't want the Lord to have to put Ichabod over the door. You know what Ichabod means? Ichabod means the glory hath departed. In a lot of churches today, that's what you see. That's why you see them dying. That's why you see them closing the doors is because Ichabod's been put over the door. And it means the glory hath departed Hey, listen, I want the Lord to meet with us. I want the Lord to have free reign. And, and that's why, I, hey, you say, well, preacher, it's not popular to say the things that you said this morning about homosexuality and the, the government and things like that. I'm not trying to be popular. Hey, listen, I just want to be obedient unto God because until we wake up and realize, hey, listen, we've got to do what God tells us to do. We're going to be in a terrible shape in this nation because until the church is strong, the nation won't be strong. And oh, how the church needs to be strong in this day and time. Hey, listen, our kids and our grandkids and, and, and your kids and, and, and on goes the list. Hey, listen, it, it matters how strong the church is. That the church would live for God. That the church would serve God. You say, well, preacher, just keep it in the four walls. God didn't make it to keep it in the four walls. God made it so that we would tell the whole world about Jesus Christ. That we would lift Him up. That we would magnify Him. Hey, what a wonderful Savior we have. What a wonderful God we have. How He loved you and gave His Son to die for you. Oh, why wouldn't you want to tell somebody about Jesus Christ? Amen. What a Savior. What a Lord. What a mighty God. Boy, I tell you what, even in the face of death this week with, with families losing loved ones, it was good to step in there into those, those uh, 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 services and, and hear them talk about they knew Jesus Christ as their Savior. Therefore, you're going to see them again one day. What a blessing. But my friend, that's getting fewer and fewer and fewer today. Oh, how we need to tell about Jesus Christ. How we need to lift him up. How we need to magnify him. Boy, I tell you what, God is so sweet and he's so good to us. It's by the mercies of God that he hasn't judged us already. It's by the mercies of God that he hasn't destroyed us already. It's by the gracious hand of God that he's allowed us to have what we have today and for America to still be where she is today and for our church to still be alive. Oh, listen, how we need to lift him up. I don't want to get to that place where the church becomes dead and where it becomes just a lethargic little service and we come in and we repeat this. And that. Hey, listen, we need to be alive for God. What a Savior. What a mighty God we serve. It's about Jesus Christ. It's not about us. It's not about what we want. It's not about what we can get. It's about lifting up Jesus Christ. In closing, we need to do what Abraham did. Look at verse 23. The first four words. And Abraham drew near. He didn't stand afar off. He drew near to the Lord and began to seek the Lord for that area. Abraham drew near to the Lord and sought the Lord with all of his heart. Abraham decided the most important thing that I can do is get close to God myself and seek Him with all my heart. What we need to do in America today and what we need to do in our church and what we need to do in our homes is we need to draw near to the Lord and repent of our sins and the sins of our nation. We need to get to plead with God and seek Him with all of our heart. And 2 Chronicles 7, 14 says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will heal their land. Then. 
But he said, it's my people. Hey, listen, if you're saved this morning, he's talking about you. He's talking about me. He's talking about us growing nigh to him, getting close to him. I, I love this fact that as, as, as the Lord told us, stand right there. And, and every, he, the Lord told us to draw nigh to him and he draw nigh to us. It's just like this. Matt, take a walk towards me. And every time that we take a step towards the Lord, the Lord takes a step close to us. Man, I tell you what, he, that's, that's better than meeting him halfway. You got to understand something. God says, if you'll draw nigh to me, thank you, man. If you'll draw nigh to me, he said, I'll come to you. He said, I want you to have a powerful church. I want you to have a powerful home. I want to bless this nation. I want to see souls saved. I want to see lives changed. I want to see the blessings of God on your home. I want to see the blessings of God on your life. I want to see the blessings on your children. I want to see you glorify uh, uh, the Lord. I want to see you lift him up. I want, he, listen, he wants to do that, but we've got to draw that him. But we're going to have to humble ourselves. Amen. One of the saddest things I see in churches today the invitation comes, and so very few will go to an altar. Oh, preacher, I can take care of my seat. You know what your problem is? You're not going to like what I'm going to have to say. It's your pride. It's your pride. Oh, that's what we're all, well, I'll, I'll take care of it at home. I'll get right later. I can do it here, preacher. I, I, I don't. Uh, pr pr preacher, you mean that I've got to go to the altar? If you've got that attitude, you do. Well, preacher, I can take care of the seat. No, you can't. If that's your attitude, no, you can't. And, and, and if some of you, it's been so long since you've been to an altar, it'd be like a calf trying to get down. Let me know. I'll come knock your feet out from underneath you. Get you down there quick. <laughs> he said, if we'll humble ourselves. In most churches, it's right there. We say we will not humble ourselves. He said, ask and seek and walk in the old paths. And they said, we'll not walk therein. We've come to a place where our pride is keeping America from seeing revival. How we need to turn to Him. God's so good to us. He's good, isn't He? What a Savior. But He is, even as Abraham said, the judge of all the earth. And he will do right. Do you notice there? Abraham confirmed you will do right. I know you will. You're the judge of all the earth. And what he did was right. But notice what he did. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Why, preacher? Because it was right. Do not think he will treat America any different. Because he will do what is right. What we need to do is do what is right. And draw nigh to him. If you know Jesus Christ your Savior, what's your number? Christian, what's your number? America, what's your number? Church, what's your number? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you for loving us. I realize not a real popular message, wasn't trying to be popular. Sometimes we must be jolted into realizing where we're at. And Lord, I see so much going on in this nation, and it's affecting our homes. It's affecting our children. It's affecting our grandchildren. It's affecting our marriages. Oh, Lord, 
Help us as a church, those who know you as their Savior, to turn our hearts completely to you. And Lord, there may be somebody here today that doesn't know if they died today that they'd go to heaven. They don't know, but this could be their last chance. I pray they'd come. Let's take a Bible and show them how to be saved.